Any others? All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word and the commitment level that our church has to it. We know that the combination of the word of God and the Holy Spirit in a person's life can make drastic changes. Lord, let us be reminded that every time we work in the nursery, serve children, teach a lesson, help an Awana, do something around the church, God, we are investing in that process. We ask today that you would help us to understand the day and the age that we live, the power that you've given us, and the difference that we can make in the lives of others. We pray for these that were mentioned today, uh, Pastor Mark, his mom, uh, for Terry, uh, for others that are traveling back to the mission field. Lord, we ask that you would be honored in their lives, their recovery, and what you do through them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, take your Bibles and go with me to 2 Peter, and we're going to do a little introductory and kind of look at the significance of this and how it plays out in our lives. Uh, during uh, church, when you go over to the church hour, uh, we're going to put, uh, I think we have about 200 different images from our adventure camp. Uh, thank you for everybody that invested, prayed, donated, served. Uh, it was an incredible week. And uh, the kids, the families, we had 23 young people involved. Over half of them were not from our church. Uh, it was a great outreach event, and half of those didn't go to church anywhere. And so we were thrilled that the gospel opportunities that we had, and a number of them uh, raised their hands for salvation uh, during the week. And so we're thrilled at uh, just the opportunity. I mean, it was a win, 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 win all the way around. So again, thank you for people that came early and set up last Sunday, people that came Friday afternoon and helped pack up. Uh, the people that were here during the week making food and helping out and field trips. It, it just really was a significant uh, investment in the lives of young people. Well, today we want to go to 2 Peter. Uh, and, and here's the big push of what Peter is talking about. Uh, Peter, of course, the spokesman for the early disciples. Sometimes he spoke out when he shouldn't have, right? Uh, so the spokesman doesn't always get it right. Uh, there's times when he, when he speaks when he shouldn't. And uh, Peter is, of course, in this passage, uh, really emphasizing this issue of false doctrine, and he's warning uh, what we need to be careful of. Uh, this probably was written right before the destruction of Rome. Uh, if you remember in the mid to late 60s, uh, what happened to Rome? Destroyed. destroyed. Remember what, what was a big part of the destruction? Fire, right? I mean, it was destroyed. Peter is writing right up against this time frame and what was happening. And so uh, there's so many parallels to understanding what is going on here in the first century to what we are facing today. And I'm not prophesying anything about, you know, fire and destruction and all of that. But when you start thinking about false teachers, uh, the warnings, uh, the difficulties that are there for the church, the struggles that Christians are having, and the difficulty that then that plays out in the church. Uh, this morning at 11, I'll be kind of part two of this, if you will, not from uh, Second Peter, but helping us understand the struggle uh, that churches are having. And COVID didn't do us any favors. Uh, you add that to the end times and churches around our country are struggling. And uh, thank God we have a relatively healthy church and we're, we're grateful for that. Uh, and really, the only reason we have that is because of you, right? It takes people that are willing to say, you know what, I'll come in early, I'll stay late, I'll serve an extra time, I'll volunteer here, I'll help out. So, so Peter is really helping with that. And the, the middle of the church of what he's talking about uh, helps us understand there's Jews and Gentiles in this church that he's writing to. Uh, that in itself kind of plays a big dynamic for how people interact uh, Dave Bisbee, who did our camp for us this week, the final day, he just did an incredible job helping kids understand in a kid language, right? Uh, the differences between skin colors, uh, people, uh, race, all the things that our kids are hearing about, seeing on the news, facing, battling against, everything that's happening in that way, uh, he dealt with that. And one of the greatest images 
that he showed uh, was the typical American family, mom and dad and two kids. The kids were twins, but one of the kids was black, brown, and the other one was white, right? And it's a nearly impossible probability that that happens, but it does happen. And the understanding really made a difference for these kids to understand we're all creations of God and the skin colors are really just, we're all different shades of brown, uh, helping them understand this race issue is fabricated. It is a uh, mess of what's happening. Hi, Matt and Sarah. Welcome home from Southern California, serving in the United States Marines. Thank you. Uh, just saw you walk in there. Good. Um, but understanding how important uh, what's going on in this first century church, right, between Jews and Gentiles. Do you think they had some conflicts? What are you doing eating that? <laughs> right? We don't have that at our church potluck. What are you bringing that for, right? You know, they, I mean, they had all kinds of issues. And so what was Peter doing? Bringing them back to the truth of God's word. That resolves the issues for us. And understanding uh, hypocrisy and understanding false teachers, right? We've all heard of the, the old ways that they would find counterfeit bills, right? You know, they would teach them so much by handling the real thing when they felt uh, in their fingertips something that was fake. They obviously knew that. Uh, if you look close enough, there's some dynamics of the, the print colors and smearing and smudging and all those things at play. Of course, now they just use a magic marker, right? And they color on it and that tells them the, whether it is or not. But What's our test for false teachers? It's the Word of God. And, you know, I, again, I just can't say enough about what's happening in our nursery, our Sunday school, our Awana program, our youth program, because what's the focus of everything that's happening there? It's God's Word. And our kids, let me tell you, our kids don't stand a chance if they're not grounded in God's Word. Let alone the adults, right? But kids don't and we as a church uh and somebody said pastor you're always on that yeah yeah and probably till i die or you fire me i'm gonna always be on the kids need the word of god we have to keep that as the center of our church we have to help them understand how important it is because it's only gonna get worse right there is no a bright shining Republican or Democrat person that's going to ride in on one kind of a horse or another and save America. It's not going to happen. And unfortunately, we look for that too often. So the purpose here, giving hope, giving direction. And so let's look at uh, what God's word says and we'll, we'll kind of go through your outline this morning. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained like precious faith. Who, who are these people then? Christians. Yeah. Born again people. right? With us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the understanding that salvation is by faith and grace. right? Ephesians chapter 2. There is no works for salvation. The only way for salvation is through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Verse 2. Grace and peace, we'll come back to that in a moment, be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, as his divine power has given to us all things. He's talking about here and now, right? It's like, I can't wait to go to heaven. Well, that will be good. But if that's all you're focused on, you're missing out on a lot of things that God has for you now. Notice what he says. He's given us all things that pertain to life, the physical and godliness, the spiritual. We have all of that. Through the knowledge of him who call us by glory and virtue, verse four, by which uh, have been given to us exceeding great precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And uh, the word corruption there, we'll come back to that, but a little bit misleading in the, in the English at least. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, these that have attended this morning. We pray that their hearts would be encouraged and strengthened. God, that each one of us would realize what your word teaches us, that you've already given to us power that is available to us today to live and to do and to be uh, exactly what you've called us to be. And so we pray this now in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Uh, a little quote from uh, Bible.org about this passage. Second Peter may be a testimonial to encourage all believers to persevere under trial, to resist false teachers, and to live faithfully in the gospel tradition, anticipating the second coming. You know, Jesus is coming back whether we're ready or not. Right? Uh, remember the old hide and seek, ready or not, here I come? Okay. Jesus is coming uh, irregardless of our being ready or whether we're not. Uh, J. Vernon McGee, some of you remember him, and you can actually still listen to J. Vernon McGee uh, through audio ways, but uh, he says this, Paul and Peter both anchored the church on the scriptures as the only defense for the coming storm. It's the only defense for the coming storm. So let's dive into this. Uh, notice back in verse number one, those who have obtained like precious faith. You know, the uniqueness of this and the wording that he uses helps Jew and Gentile both. You have the same faith, right? Because you can only imagine uh, bringing them together and everything that was steeped in Old Testament tradition, Old Testament scriptures, to now people that maybe as Gentiles, they have zero understanding of the Old Testament. And basically at this point, they don't even have the written New Testament. And so he's bringing them together to say, look, you have the same faith. This is faith in Jesus Christ. And a lot of times in like denominational labels, right? Uh, people get a little divided, you know, well, well, what church do you go to, right? You know, and then kind of, you know, hey, the bottom line is, do you have Jesus, right? And I think it's, you know, there's times and there's places maybe where it's important uh, that we stick to that. But for the most part, uh, we're going to fellowship for eternity with people that didn't go to a Baptist church. <laughs> Scary, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and it, it just, you know, we've come a long way, so to speak, in that. But you know what? We, we have to kind of understand what's most important. And I think God's Word helps us with that. And so, you know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We're saved by... You know, put faith and grace there, right? And just for fun sometime, reread that and switch those two words. Because in a sense, I mean, we understand that... God's grace came first, but then I had to respond in faith, but my faith is what brought that grace to me, right? And we, we can kind of play that and understand the depth of our salvation that has been given to us by faith in Jesus Christ. So let me go back to this here uh, for those of you that want to fill in the blanks. Those who have faith and what? It's by the righteousness of God. By the way, the outline that is in the bulletin this morning is not the correct one, right? It's Pastor Mark's, and you'll probably hear it sometime. Um, those of you that came in late, he's got COVID, he's not here, and uh, so I'm preaching today. But uh, we have printed ones for those of you that can't get through the sermon without filling in the blanks, okay? So, uh, so those are available. I love this understanding of righteousness uh, and you've heard me say this before, the New Testament describes it uh, as being cloaked or covered with the righteousness of Christ. You know, I mean, like, imagine the largest bathrobe in the world, okay? I, I don't know what that is, right? If, I don't even know if you can go find a triple X size bathrobe. I, I don't know, but whatever the biggest one there is, right? Maybe it's a custom made one, but take that and wrap that around you as many times as possible. That's the description that you and I have been cloaked. We've been wrapped around with the righteousness of Christ. There is nothing in me that can bring about salvation. I can't do it on my own. I can't even comprehend it to the depths that I truly, genuinely need. In Romans chapter 3, uh, if I can jump over there quickly. Romans chapter 3 Paul so adequately helps us understand that. But look at verse uh, 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. You can't work your way into heaven. Isn't it amazing how many churches actually teach that? 
Now, they may not say, work your way to heaven, but they're going to tell you to do this and do this and do this and do this. Remember last week I talked about the abuse of freedom? A lot of evangelical churches, some of the churches that maybe you grew up in, emphasized a lot of man-made rules, right? Don't smoke, chew, and dance with girls that do or something. I don't know. You're right. I mean, all those yeah. <laughs> things that people used to say, right? You know, it's like, you can't do that, right? And they're, they're almost tying it together with your salvation. And it has nothing to do with salvation. Now that you're distracted, verse 21. <laughs> Now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. I'm in Romans chapter 3. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. There it is. It's not just in you, but it's on you. It's the righteousness that we have through Jesus Christ. Now, this gets better, okay? Because that's just really describing the... The group, the, the Jews and the Gentiles that have faith in Christ, the, the understanding of who Peter was writing to. Notice verse 2 through 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Jesus Christ our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So he really there's a dual meaning here. It's the here and now and the here and after. But it's also how I live. And how I be what God wants. Right? Because you know, let's, let's say coming to church this morning is something we should do. Right? I think the scriptures teach us that. I think faithful church attendance is part of what God's word teaches us. Right? Fellowshipping with the body of Christ and extracurricular things. Core group or Wednesday night barbecue or something. Right? All those things God's word teaches us. But it doesn't necessarily mean that because you came to Wednesday barbecue, you are being the person you should be. There's a big difference, right? And so this is helping us with this divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. It's not just enough to say great promises. It's great and precious promises. Promises. So notice here, uh, he talks about grace and peace in verse number two, right? Uh, what, what is grace? We've talked about grace for the whole first part of this year. What? Give me some descriptions. Larry. Grace is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, submission, and self-control. Okay, all right, so it's lived out that way, right? What else? Unmerited favor. Somebody else said something. So how does that apply to us if he's given us grace? Unmerited favor. There's another word that's used uh, that we don't typically use it that way in the New Testament, but pleasure. Right? I mean, think about it. like your, your children or your grandchildren. Right? That favor, that pleasure, that joy they bring. It's like, you know, even when they do wrong, like grandma's like, oh, you're so cute. Right? <laughs> Why? The favor, the grace, the pleasure that they bring to that person's life. Helping us understand that. Um, but he also uses peace there. And it talks about the comfort that only God can give to us. Right? I mean, think of some of your stories and what you've been through in life. Some pretty horrific, tragic things that you have experienced. And it's the comfort of God that allows you to continue on. Right? Why do people take their own lives? Why do people get into the abuse of, you know, maybe a pill or a bottle? Right? Why do they, you know, kind of have this breakdown, if you will. Why, why do things like that happen? A lot of it, at times, is connected because there's no peace. They can't find peace. There's nothing in them that is bringing some satisfaction or peace, and you and I have that through what God has done to us. Notice, uh, he also says there, in the knowledge of, uh, I already took it off the screen, but it, it's a, a precise and correct knowledge. 
right? Uh, you ever like remember back when you were dating and you really went out of your way to do something for your spouse and and you thought what you were doing was going to be like a home run like i remember taking terry like in college to a baseball game <laughs> i was like yeah no, right? You know, now we'll go just for fun and kicks, right? But uh, but back then, that was not what she wanted to do, right? You know, but now I know that, right? There's certain you know, things that you do and you don't do, right? That's the understanding of precision and correctness that comes with what? Time in a relationship. And that's the knowledge that you and I are growing in as we faithfully read God's word, as we pray, as we attend church and hear the word of God, as we socialize together and we fellowship around the word of God, we're growing in that knowledge that he talks about. So notice he says, all things provided. If God didn't give it to me, I don't need it. But my credit card will buy it. Okay? There's a lot of times that we get into this struggle of thinking, I need something else. And genuinely, truly, if I need it, God says you have it, right? You know, Philippians 4, is it 13 or 19? Um, My God shall supply all of your needs, right? He repeats that promise to us over and over again. And he says, I've given you this power, verse number three, if you're looking at your scriptures. Uh, the word power is translated mighty work, strength, miracle working power. So what are you facing this week? Right? Like some of you don't want to go to work Monday morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or... You know the family phone call is about to drop. Right? I mean, that's just real life, isn't it? We know the conflict that happens between people. And it's just like, I just know the explosion is going to happen. But when we think through this, God has given to me the peace, the grace, the strength, everything that I need to be what I should be during that time. Doesn't mean it's easy, doesn't mean it's going to be pleasurable, but you can get through it and you can honor the Lord through that. So all things provided for everyday life, right? everyday life. If you go back to the passage, everything, God's provided everything for life and what godliness, two different aspects. Um, change pages here. Matthew Henry said this, uh, he's long gone and written tons of commentaries and scripture things. Uh, the fountain of all spiritual blessings is the divine power of Jesus Christ. You know, our fountain over here died a week or two ago, right? We just wait for somebody to, to fix it, right? Uh, but it died. It's no longer pumping water and the water that's in there is what? Nasty, right? Stagnant, ugly, right? You know, because why? There's no flow. There's no power coming through it. Is that an illustration of a Christian that's not relying on, depending on the spirit, the power of God for us? Nothing's flowing through us. And it becomes stagnant. And then we get, what, bitter? We become negative. We get a little uh, hard to deal with. We don't, people don't want to be around us. God's given us what we need. I love the word that he uses here for life, uh, absolute fullness and vitality. You know somebody with fullness and vitality? This week, Dave Bisbee, and that, that guy runs like, I, I don't know what he runs on. <laughs> You know, he, he, we were talking one night, I took him to dinner, and he's like, yeah, my wife and I get up every day at 4.15. I said, why, you're retired. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> I don't get up at 4.15. It's what? 
It's nighttime still, it is. I was up at five this morning and it was still not bright enough, right? You know, why? But he, he has a energy that God has given to his personality and it's passion about his ministry. And they get up and they pray together. She still works. They do all kinds of Bible study things together, right? So there is a reason for their madness. Um, but God's given him something. Yeah, some of you do that regularly. Um, God's given him something. But we have that available to us. It may not be your personality, right? But there is a power of vitality that is available to us. Uh, notice also uh, for godly living. You know, in bottom line, this is most important. Right? We all do things for the Lord. We serve and and, and I trust you're using your spiritual gift, right? Because talents, natural abilities are different than spiritual gifts. God has given you a spiritual gift uh, to be used. Um, I, I was talking with somebody not long ago, and, and they just they literally put their calling from God aside. And I'm like, whoa. Don't do that. God wants to use you. He has something for you. He wants to incredibly bless you for obedience to that. Don't do that. And so how important it is that we're carrying out not just the doing part of Christianity, but the being part. He's given us everything that is necessary for our godly living. Notice also, so these are under the gifts of God. All things provided and then precious promises. When you think of promises in Scripture, not a specific promise, but what satisfaction does that bring to you? Hope. Did you hear Debbie? Brings hope. Right? What else? Confidence, reassurance, comfort, peace, faithfulness, right? You know, we've all had broken promises. People that broke promises to us and we've broken promises to them. Right? It happens. We don't like it, it but it happens. God will never break that promise. And therefore, I have peace and hope and confidence and the comfort that God gives to me through that. Uh, the key word in that passage, if you look at verse number 4, uh, he, he talks about, let me get back there, sorry. Uh, whoop, I'm in the wrong place. But he says, whereby, these promises, they whereby they've come to us. It goes back to the relationship. Right? There's a reason a promise is going to happen, it's because of relationship. When you and I think through promises, Right? We don't typically promise people that we don't know, but there might be an occasion for that. It's typically based on a relationship. Right? I know you as my family member, I know you as my friend, uh, and I promise I'm going to do this. And is it hard to keep promises sometimes? Sure. Circumstances change. Relationships change. Sometimes I just don't want to, right? Right? I mean, there's all these reasons. And what you and I have as followers of Christ is based on the promise that God's given to me. And what is it? I'm sharing in God's nature in this life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, all has become new. Right? I have a new nature. That's what makes it possible. My old nature someday says, nope, ain't gonna happen. Don't want it to happen. Let's not go there. Right? And then my new nature is like, okay. Right? 
You get stretched, you get fatigued, you get worn out, you get interruptions, all the things of life. But it's our new nature, it's the nature of God that's inside of me that drives me forward and propels me to that. The same meaning is found, and let me give you two other ones. In John chapter 3, verse 3, where he talks about us being born again. Right? And that, you know, we don't maybe use that phrase as much, but, you know, there was, there was a time where, you know, that was the big catchphrase in Christianity, right? You, you're, are you born again? Uh, you know, I mean, what's a, you know, a non-believer like, what are you talking about, right? But John 3, and then in Romans chapter 8, where he says, we are in Christ. So it's the same idea of having this new nature. I am a different person. Doesn't mean I'm perfect, but it typically means that I confess when I'm not perfect, or I'm convicted when I'm not perfect. I try to resolve the issue when I'm not perfect. Literally, and I, I think we could, you know, I'm the child of God. I have the Holy Spirit of God in me. Then he talks about this, uh, if you notice uh, the word corruption, I think if you read, well, depending on the scripture you have, I'm able to overcome corruption in, in two ways. One, physical death corruption, right? As a follower of Christ, as someone who is born again, someone who is in Christ, I have the ability given to me by God to live forever. I overcome corruption. I'm overcoming death. And that's the best sales pitch for most people that aren't Christians, right? You want to live forever? You want to go to heaven? Right? I mean, we, we have this idea that as a Christian, you have eternal life. But it also has a dual meaning of I'm able to overcome corruption today. I don't have to sin. I choose to sin. I don't have to act that way. I, I Sometimes I just want to act that way. right? There's this corrupt nature in me, but God's power is there also. And I can live differently. And unfortunately, not all followers of Christ choose that. So, what's the, the application for us? Through faith in Christ, you've become a child of God. You know, it's exciting... Uh, learning the stories uh, this week of the kids that were here, uh, where they came from, how they got here, who their parents were, who their grandparents were, uh, some of the struggles that they faced, you know, I mean, you name it, A to Z, we had it here this week, right? I mean, that's just the nature of, of people. And yet when you started talking to them about salvation, the Holy Spirit, what, you could see God at work in their life, right? And several of those young people so I, I need Jesus. I, I want to be saved. I want Christ in my life, right? And I'm not God. I don't know everything, right? But we just trust that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God was at work in their life. And what they are a child of God now. And, you know, the, the big uh, predestination and all those debates that we have. There there's, comes a point we just have to trust the sovereignty of God at work in people's lives, Amen. right? We can't be all things, know all things, do all things. God is God and he'll take care of it, right? We have to be faithful, but it was exciting not to be a small part of watching what he was doing. Through Christ, you have access to everything necessary for a God-honoring life. All of us are aware of people that at least claim to be Christians. All right, here again. I don't know. Right? I'm not God. But some that are claim to be a Christian, but they're not living a God-honoring life. Or some that are Christians that are in church every week, but they're not using their spiritual gift, or they're not being obedient, or they have a secret sin life apart from church. Right? We don't know all those things. But I have the ability in Christ. He's given me all things. And it begins with power for what? Life and godliness. I can be what he wants me to be. And then through his promises, I can live that out. God, you said you would never leave me or forsake me. 
God, you said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God, you said, you'll never put more on me than I can handle. Right? We're claiming the promises so that we can live the way he wants us to live. Not always easy, but it's the right thing to do. And in the end, when you lay your head down at night, you can sleep peacefully knowing you are in that right relationship with God. So, big challenge for us. Be what God wants us to be. Use the resources that God's made available to us. Comments or questions? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time. Thank you for what you're doing, not only in our own lives, but through our church. Lord, it's been exciting over the last two or three weeks to see uh, new people stepping into ministry, people volunteering to be a part of, young people being baptized, people coming to know Christ, new ministry starting, and all the things that you are actively doing in people's lives. Lord, let us stay focused and encouraged because of you. And we ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hey, thanks for being here. Uh, by the way, uh, I think in two weeks, uh, some of you remember the Bean family. Uh, they used to come as four brothers and sing, the, and then um, the, the husband-wife, they're coming back in two weeks, and their teenage daughter, who was probably like that the last time they were here, uh, they're going to be singing for us on the 24th, I believe. All right, see you in church.